Okay. Okay. All right. Good morning. Um, my name is Ryoshi Banerjee, and I'm the Executive Director of the Public Design Commission. In the absence of Acting Vice President Phil Ahrens, who just had personal reasons he couldn't be here today, I will conduct today's meeting. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone who's participating in person at City Hall and also those who are joining remotely. As a reminder, the members of the public can attend and give testimony either in person or remotely. Please note that Commissioner Valverde is participating in voting remotely due to a recent medical operation. And now we will begin with the committee meeting with the conceptual review of the construction of a head house as part of the Owl's Head combined CSO facility, Gowanus Canal. We will not hear public testimony or vote on this project today. Presenters, you may begin when you're ready. Okay. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Shriyoshi. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Alicia West, and I am DEP's Director of Public Design Outreach. I'm joined today by Kevin Keating from Seldorf Architects and Anna Holkalter from Scape Landscape Architecture. We also have my colleague from DEP, who is our portfolio manager for all of the Gowanus Superfund projects on Zoom today, he should be there, Kevin Clark. Um, so we're so happy to be back to talk to you about this really important project, um, as which as I said, is a component of the Gowanus Superfund, Superfund program, which is mandated by the US EPA. Um, as you may remember, we were last here in July uh, to present designs for the relocation of DSNY's salt shed, which is being moved out of the way for DEP to build our combined sewer <laughs> overflow facility. Um, so today we are here to present the head house um, for DEP's CSO facility. And this facility, which we'll go into a little bit more detail later, will collect and store combined sewer um, combined sewage, um, which would otherwise be discharged into the Gowanus Canal during rain events. Um, so this project is a priority for DEP and for the city. We are on an aggressive schedule set for us by the EPA and final designs for our CSO facility are due to the EPA in August 2023. Um, so as you may recall, and I think you are all aware, we are also working on about 1.8 acres of public open space, which will be along the waterfront of our, the peninsula of our waterfront. Um, we, Anna is gonna speak a little bit about our uh, ongoing public engagement process for that and the design goals that we've established there. Um, we do have a bit more work to do with our stakeholders, our agency partners, and of course the EPA on coordinating the design of that public realm. So we're gonna have more to come on that in the coming months. Today, we're really here focused on that head house, which is due into the EPA and is that that is, has to be the priority. Um, but I do wanna say that um, we're so fortunate to have this incredible design team that is working really in lockstep, um, creating meaningful open space for this community as a priority of this project. Um, and we've been tasked by this community to really carry forward the true character of Gowanus, which is this very unique mix of natural systems and industrial facilities. And so we see these two components as completely combined and you know, it's a really a priority for us. So while we don't have a ton of information on the open space for you today, we will be back, I promise. <laughs> and we're really excited to be able to share that. Um, so I'm gonna hand this over to Kevin now, who's gonna walk you through some of the site planning um, and familiarize you with the site context and then walk you through the design. And Anna, as I said, will speak a little bit about the public engagement and the yeah. Great. Oh, you don't need to have this. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Keating. I'm a partner at Silver Architects. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Um, just allow me a little of your time to walk you around the site and orient you to the Kiwanis Canal. Kiwanis Canal is in Brooklyn. Uh, this is now a view of the canal. This is uh, phase two of a two phase project. The first phase was for the head end site. Uh, we were here in 2018, presenting that to you. 2019, we were happily awarded the Design Excellence Award. Uh, but today we are here to talk about the Owl's Head site, which is located at the bend of the canal. Is this? We're just sharing this. Okay, so uh, just to slightly reorient the plan. 
The site is located on a peninsula. It's about 5.1 acres. It has 1,700 linear feet of waterfront uh, opportunity. Uh, we're located in the north end of the South Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone. This is a zone created by the city uh, to promote uh, industrial and manufacturing uses within the overall confines of the city. One key element here is that uh, you'll see the Sixth Street Turning Basin, which we'll refer to often. Uh, that's located right south of the site. Whole Foods Esplanade is located right along here. This is the Third Street Bridge. Uh, and down here along Smith Street and over, the, over this route here is the F train viaduct, which both the F and the G train ride from. This is a view uh, from the F train viaduct. Actually, this is the Smith and 9th Street station. It's the highest elevated station in all of New York City. It has a great vantage view of the site. You can see the outline of the site there. Um, this is the IBZ zone that we are in. You can see it's a relatively monochromatic industrious building palette that's around us. This is now uh, a view of the site as you're coming in uh, on the F train towards Carroll Street Station. Uh, here you can see the Sixth Street Turning Basin. Uh, this is the tip of the peninsula and it starts to make, make its way back towards the Esplanade and then up north towards the head end of the canal. This is now a view uh, from that location, the Esplanade. Uh, our site is on page left. You could see the F train viaduct. There's a Smith and 9th Street Station as it makes its way into Carroll Street in the background. This is a view now north looking south. Um, the salt shed is right there. Uh, you can see the IBZ zone that we are in, very monochromatic, low industrial businesses, and the F train viaduct that lights up over the Kiwanis Canal. Here I'll just walk you through. These are some ground photos of the site and the area we're dealing with adjacent to it. This is the DOC facility directly across the street on 2nd Avenue. These are views at the corner of 2nd Avenue and 6th Street. This is a view of the current uh, Sixth Street Turning Basin. Um, there's the parking facility, which I'll show you. That's on the peninsula right now. Uh, it's a view of the, from the site. And this is a view of the DSMY lot as it currently is. Uh, again, these are views looking towards the site in their current condition. Um, that's a view kind of looking down south towards the site. This is a view right along the water. Uh, same, this is a view which we just highlighted in the previous image. Uh, and this is the new bulkhead that is being erected as we speak. So I'll just walk you around the site and show you what's on site currently. We'll start with sixth, uh, Second Avenue. Second Avenue goes north south, directly adjacent to it is the DOC facility. They have a parking facility that's located at the north end, which needs ac continuous access throughout the entirety of the construction process. Uh, we have DEP pump station. That pump station will be integrated into the new facility. Adjacent to that is the current DSMY lot and the salt shed itself. And adjacent to that is obviously a big reuse composting facility, facility which has a partnership with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Uh, the site is bisected by Fifth Street. That will be demapped as part of this overall project. South of that site right now is a series of industrial and manufacturing buildings. Uh, DEP is working with th these, these businesses to move, move them excuse me, elsewhere. Um, but adjacent to that, and at the tail end of the peninsula is a large parking facility. Let me just remind you that currently Sixth Street Turning Basin is inaccessible to the public as we speak. We are hoping to change that. So as I mentioned, um, we need to uh, keep continuous operations for DSMY uh, throughout, throughout the entirety of the construction process. So that was uh, phase one, which I'll go into shortly. Um, we presented that to you back in August of this year. Um, so there's our current Salt lot, uh, we are creating a new salt lot and salt shed. There's communal um, activities that are currently programmed for that space um, tied with the GCC. We are working with both the GCC and Gowanus, uh, uh, sorry, Big Reuse in order to incorporate their program. And in most cases, it's a pretty shared program. Uh, along with working with our friends over at SCAPE to introduce the ecological co components of the site uh, into integrating them into new public waterfront access. The biggest uh, facility, new facility here will obviously be a CSO facility. And so with that, um, this is just a really simple diagram, but a simple diagram illustrating the infrastructure that needs to be placed on the site. First phase was the DSMY salt shed and the salt lot. Phase two is the Guana CSO facility. And phase three will be the GCC and the compost facility uh, paired with the balance of the site, which we hope to provide as much public access as possible. 
This side here, this is the phasing of the project. It's relatively complex, but just to simplify it a little bit, uh, this was the salt shed, um, which I just mentioned. This is phase two, which we are here to talk about today, the CSO facility itself. And phase three will be the composting and GC components along with the open space for the rest of the peninsula. Just to remind you, uh, this is what we presented to um, this, this group here back in August of 2022. This is the salt shed in, in its temporary condition. The composting will be moved elsewhere. It's located here in order to provide access to the composting facility while the rest of the site is in construction. This here is an image of the salt lot in its permanent condition. Um, as you can see here, one of the big efforts we are trying to push is that striking balance between industry and nature. Uh, and at this moment of time, I will just hand it over to our friends at SCAPE. Is this working? Great, thank you. I'm Anna Hochalter. I'm a landscape architect with SCAPE. I'm really happy to be here today presenting the public realm design concept as part of this project. And as Alicia mentioned, um, we're really still in the works with a lot of agencies um, and, st and stakeholders right now. So the design we're presenting today is more about the concept and big picture. And the team will be back to you with the actual design um, in the future. So um, DEP is, is very committed to creating an iterative design process with the community. Um, and, and what that means at this point is that we've had three community workshops um, they've all had a different type of focus. So our first workshop really sought to hear community priorities in terms of programming. Um, the second workshop uh, reported back on what we heard and got more feedback to refine our understanding of the types of public programmings on site that are of interest. And our third workshop got into a bit more detail to understand uh, what was meant by uh, some certain materiality preferences like reflecting the Gowanus Canal. So some of the key things we've heard uh, were to reflect the Gowanus character, um, to provide space for outdoor education and community gatherings um, and performance. We've heard a strong priority and prioritization on ecology and, and functioning ecological systems to do as much natural shoreline as possible, native planting, uh, maritime, maritime planting, uh, tidal wetlands. Um, and then lastly, uh, a strong, desire for providing water access and um, pedestrian access, uh, both at the Turning Basin and at Second Avenue. So we've <clears throat> worked through that, that uh, wide array of input um, and have this current public realm program goal diagram here. So our primary goals based on the community feedback we heard include improving site resilience, which really means for this site, looking at tidal fluctuations, both today and in future tidal conditions along the Gowanus Canal. So there's a lot of grade change that's happening on this site um, in order to uh, both meet the desire to incorporate tidally influenced natural shorelines and to have uh, higher elevations where critical infrastructure and city facilities are above those tidal elevations. So the grade change is something that we see as a design opportunity. And we're really working to incorporate um, things like amphitheater seating or seat steps or ADA ramps that can uh, really leverage those elevational changes and make it a very dynamic public waterfront. Um, another primary goal is to provide public access to the waterfront. And we really see the best opportunity here along the waterfront itself. Oh. Sorry, quickly. Oh. Um, whoops. Sorry about that. So uh, primary access along the water's edge itself. So key entrances from 6th Street, uh, walking along a basin esplanade, larger program area um, at what we call the point where there's opportunities for tidal wetland, community gathering, outdoor classrooms, bioretention, um, moving along a canal esplanade to, this, to a street end at 2nd Avenue. So primary entrances from these two ends uh, with, with access along the access drive, Kevin mentioned that's going to be demapped. There's going to be the primary operations um, corridor. So we're working closely with all of the teams and with our design and materiality to um, make sure that that's a safe environment. Um, we're also working with uh, the stakeholders for the GCC, the big reuse and DSNY. Um, and we do believe that we'll be able to bring um, pedestrian access through the middle so it won't be such a, a block um, 
please keep in mind that what you're seeing, at least in the, the GCC big reuse area is very much a placeholder. We're still working through that design. It won't be a solid, yeah, thank you, won't be a solid gray um, rectangle. It'll be a dynamic um, community space. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the types of um, community programming that GCC and big reuse do. So we're working very closely to articulate and refine the design language um, between that interface as well as the public um, peninsula. Um, and that supports another goal, which is to provide environmental stewardship and ecological functions on site. Um, we are seeking to celebrate the neighborhood's cultural and historic character um, and to provide safety in a mixed use infrastructure area. So lastly, uh, you can see how those programmatic goals are starting to take shape. We're working very closely with all of the design teams uh, to refine the experiences along the waterfront, keeping in mind how the spatial relationships work between the public realm and the waterfront esplanade um, and, and the facilities themselves. So you're getting a, a sneak peek at the CSO facility, which is what Kevin will be presenting next. But this is really to give you a sense of this, the spatial relationships between the waterfront, the facilities, um, and kind of the scale comparison. So um, the design is, is very much in the conceptual phase as we're working closely with EPA and with DEP and with other stakeholders to refine the design details. So we'll be coming back um, in the future with more detail. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Kevin. Big reuse. Sure. In this image, in this image, it's uh, so this is not showing the full peninsula. What's not shown is the sort of oh, title, okay. title marsh point. Uh, but big reuse is here. Salt shed is here. Uh, CSO facility, which Kevin will present on, and then Second Avenue ends there. This is the canal itself, and it's um, really just focused on the facility, which is where the design team has focused. So that's why the image is. I have one just small question. It, do you see that the big reuse, the composting, that that will be growing in scope and scale, or is that is it going to stay the same size? Um, it's not. Do you... um, so we are working with big reuse, and they have they have a little bit of time to think about what their program is going to look like when this is all built out. Because mm -hmm. the way the phasing is working is we're providing them with an interim facility as a part of phase one, so they're taking the opportunity to think through what that might be. We know what their square footage uh, requirements are, and they're thinking through the technologies that may be you know sort of on the cutting edge at this point. We don't anticipate it's going to be larger. I just want to just give you a heads up. I mean, when I Google Gowanus smell, the next thing, auto in, of death. Okay, but but now it's a super fun site. It's going to be cleaned up. So the, name, the next thing is that the smell of death will be removed. But if, if there's this big reuse, and that's the thing that's right next to the public park, uh, all of a sudden people will notice that that is where they're taking their children and they're in proximity to composting. And I just wondered if, if it was gonna get bigger and if it was gonna be the only uh, place to be smelly anymore, if people would like to take their children next to the compost site. So, some people want to show their children composting and some people do not. And, um, and, and I wondered, and I, I saw a video online that they posted for big reuse and there, they said they didn't have a problem with smell, but then they also made facilities so that they could have dangerous sludge runoff capturing. And as it is now, I don't really see how that all works together, that there could be dangerous sludge and children's play equipment right next to each other. Well, I will say we're not building play equipment. We're not building a playground here. Yeah. This is okay. what we've heard from the community is really a tremendous amount of support for a space that fosters environmental stewardship. Um, and I think that composting is a major part of that. Yep. And we do have these partners built into this project with Big Reuse and Juana's Canal Conservancy who are have incredibly dynamic public programming, bringing students of all ages here, uh, working with them, helping them understand these natural systems, helping them understand the, the history of the canal. Um, so I absolutely hear you on the smell thing. And I think it is something that, um, 
big reuse is is looking at um but you know we do we have a good amount of uh space to work with here and um, and methane emissions from the compost it's, yeah so but well, i totally hear you so thank yeah. you <laughs> right uh can i turn it over to kevin yeah okay thank you um okay so facility operations for the cso uh project itself is just uh quickly walk you through everything. Um, we have what's called a combined sewer, uh, meaning that all the water that's flushed from your toilet or your sink combined goes into one singular pipe. Unfortunately, that, that pipe also includes any rain and runoff. So during a heavy rainstorm event, that pipe has a certain capacity. The pipe hit, that hits its capacity and is forced to discharge. And unfortunately, force it to discharge into our waterways. Our goal here is to intercept that water before it is discharged into our waterways and store that sewage water uh, and store that sewage water uh, in, in the sequential tanks that are below grade. The majority of the structure is below grade, even though the head house may seem like a large facility, the, the, the biggest part of this project is below grade. Uh, there's a couple of things I'll go into as far as what the component tree is, and I think it shows better in another slide or so. But our, our facility is really one massive tank. It's an unmanned facility. It's one massive tank to hold that water there before the CSO pipe or the system has enough volume and space and bandwidth basically to introduce that water back into the system and down to the LSED treatment facility. So the site and mass in. So we are located uh, directly adjacent to Second Avenue and that's due to the reason that the CSO pipe is in Second Avenue. It currently discharges at the head end of Second Avenue into the canal. Our goal is to divert that water into our new facility uh, it will come here at this location, which is where the prime screening room will be. It then sequentially makes its way uh, into these tanks and fills up these tanks as the storm is still hovering above the city. This is just a diagram showing the poche is the figure ground uh, of the facility and its components. Uh, here, I just wanna highlight um, the great elevation we will need to be dealing with. There's a plus seven elevation at Second Avenue and Fifth Street, what will be eventually the access drive. Uh, we need to make our way up to plus 14 feet, which is the design of flood elevation for the facility. Um, you, here you can see here, um, series of arrows indicating vehicular traffic, some higher, some medium and so low frequency traffic. Most of the traffic for the salt lot will be seasonal and most uh, traffic for the facility will be uh, sporadic at times. Uh, we just note there is a parking lot, a DOC parking lot facility that we still need to access as I mentioned before. And again, future access for uh, the GCC and the composting facility. Um, so just to walk you into the building, um, this is a machine. It's an unmanned facility. Uh, we're here to store 8 million gallons of water before it is discharged into our waterways. Um, there is access required over these tanks, which we are working with our friends, both at DEP and with our uh, friends over at SCAPE to try to mitigate that as much as possible. Um, there will be uh, vessels outside, these are odor control vessels. These vessels here are literally there to purify any air that may have been infiltrated into the facility. Any air in the facility is sealed and is thus pumped through the scrubbers, they're scrubbed, they're purified before any air is let out through that stack. There's purified air that comes out of that stack. Um, just to walk you in, water enters in here at Second Avenue, it comes through the primary space. This is the main screening room. These elements here are literally screens that pull any debris that may have infiltrated the system. Um, up here in the mezzanine level, kind of see it, but basically those are deep gritters. They're there to remove any sludge that may still be in the water before the water is pumped back into the system and down to the LSUD site. And up here, um, this is the fan room. That fan there is again there to pull the air in and then put, put it into the uh, odor control vessels that will scrub that air. So this is, uh, we're working with our engineers, great group of engineers um, to um, achieve Envision Gold for the project. Um, it obviously starts by remediating the brownfield that we're in. Uh, secondly, the goal is to prevent 4 million gallons of sewage water from entering the waterways. Uh, thirdly, we, with the site and around the site, we are looking to try to create as much bioretention as possible in order to manage uh, rain run, uh, storm runoff. All our sensitive equipment will be raised higher than the flood, 100 flood year elevation. Uh, in certain cases, plus 52 inches on top of that. In certain other cases, plus six, 36 inches on top of that. Uh, we will be introducing high efficiency equipment, which will reduce the operating energy by more than 
uh, with the push from the community, we we're introducing green roofs um, on all of our volumes in the building to reduce the heat island effect and manage rain runoff. And we will obviously be uh, procuring all our material through a sustainability um, route using as much recycled content as possible. Now I'll just quickly walk you through this for the sake of time. Uh, this is Second Avenue here. This is the inlet below uh, the facility. This is the prime space here, the screening room. That's where those uh, screens are that removes any physical debris that may have infiltrated the system. Um, that water then makes its way into these tanks. These are tanks that are sequentially uh, aligned underneath. Uh, these are floodgates that basically are just locks that we could lock any of these cells at any given time. Um, that's the primary space we'll say there. These secondary volumes here that are adjacent to that, it, you know, house the pump station, uh, electrical equipment, instrumentation rooms, and also facilities for Con Ed at that western side. The tertiary element is that outdoor element there. That's where those odor control vessels are and the stack itself. This is now view just stepping up. This is the primary volume raising up here. The secondary volume is sort of fade away. Uh, we are introducing those green roofs, as I mentioned. Uh, this is the fan room, and this is the degridders that sits up in a mezzanine overlooking the prime screening room there. And lastly, this is an overall goal that we're trying to achieve as much green roof on this facility as possible. So this is an image of the site itself. That's the existing salt lot. And I just kind of want to walk you back through these images here and really pause for a second to say that with the feedback from the community, um, we really wanted to look at the canal um, and really kind of pull together what, what the essence of the canal was. Um, and it's these anonymous industrial buildings that really set the, the defining sort of essence of what this facility is or what this area is. Um, this dynamic between industry and natural systems, here we are on the site looking across at a concrete facility, which used to be pretty ubiquitous up and down the canal if you're familiar with it over the decades. One thing we started to pick up on was this tubular uh, bulk head, bulkheading, which was an early form of bulkheading. It eventually transitioned into uh, timber lagging and then eventually concrete lagging. This is a, a view of that facility. This is at the corner as it bends up north going to the head end site. Uh, this is that concrete facility as we see it. But here, uh, this is an image that is nostalgic to us. It really meant a lot to the community when we showed it to them. Uh, it really defines the overall essence of the project and of the environment that we're trying to achieve and continue to achieve, this striking balance between natural systems and industry. Believe it or not, this is a view of our site. This is uh, the DSMY salt shed is right here. Behind that is the DOC facility that is currently there. And behind that, uh, back before 2014, were the Burns Brothers coal dockets. It's this industrious vernacular and geometry that we've really honed in on. And it starts to set the groundwork for what we believe is the sculptural beauty that's created by these industrial forms. Okay. Next sculptural beauty? Yeah, to some of us. <laughs> yes, definition of terms. To some of us, yes. It, it's the, uh, the Red Hood Grain Terminal. Uh, you can see this beautiful rippling form that's there at structure to support the weight of the grain, but they're kind of creating a sort, sort of lyrical facade. Um, that paired with, again, the early- Full disclosure, I'm an artist, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> that there paired with the early form of bulkheading, which was these tubular, tubular piles. We've started to really focus in on what this facility can be. How can it hark back to the essence of Guam? It's again, a very industrious environment. Um, the neighborhood told us, the community told us they wanted these facilities to be true to their industrial nature. And so we've sort of really pushed ourselves to try to achieve that. Here you can see on page left, um, this is a concrete formwork. We've done many studies in our office with clay models to try to see how we could carve at the concrete. Concrete will be used for the building in order to meet this critical infrastructural needs. Uh, but in addition to that, we further thought, can we carve at this singular sort of entity and eliminate the need for an external envelope? And so we're working with our engineers to try to achieve an overall sort of makeup for this facility that eliminates that need for an envelope, keeps it true to its core, literally. The second image is an image um, that we think speaks to that, that sort of note, that striking balance between industry and nature. Uh, and this, this third one here, this plywood formwork, 
Uh, that's basically what we're trying to achieve as a, as a more natural imprint on the plinth that we need to have around the building in order to raise the building up to 14 yeah, feet. Question, sure. So these are precast panels. Uh, in, in this. Yeah, and you're, proposed, you're not proposing, you're- proposing That's right, cast in place. place. Cast in place. Yes, okay. yes, that's important to us. Yeah. And we're hoping to achieve that. Um, so this is really simple and elegant palette here, but the concrete, which you see, it's how we want to form it. Um, stainless steel, again, very corrosive internal environment. Um, glass, we're using to, we're proposing to have uh, curved glass, which I'll, sh I'll show you in a minute. Um, and all this just creates a really simple, industrious and uh, corrosive resistant palette for the building. Uh, here is a full scale mock-up that we did. We, we played with the, um, we play with the overall size of this sort of rippled concave tubular form. Uh, we ended up at a dimension of 26 inches apart. And uh, we feel that gives a real pedestrian, pedestrians will be up against the building, be able to touch the building. We feel it gives them a pedestrian friendly scale, which they could appreciate. And now just this next image, I'll just pull you right into the proposal. This is now an image of the facility um, in the proposed form. This is at the Northeast corner. This is the primary space. This is the largest volume in the project. Uh, you can see this concave tubular formwork that kind of creates this harmonic facade along each of these surfaces. It's then broken by a series of datums, horizontal datums, both at the top and at this cornice line. Um, and it sits on this uh, plinth, uh, this seven foot plinth, which has a natural imprintation, which kind of blends it in with the surrounding um, scape, landscape that will be forthcoming. Uh, the Kiwanis Canal is on page right here. Just kind of quickly walk you around the building. Oh, and then obviously to mention, which I forgot, uh, these large apertures, um, this will be created by curved glass. Um, these, both of these apertures will be very reflective during the day and luminous at night. So this is, this is the north elevation. Um, this is that aperture that I was talking about into the primary screening room. Uh, this is the plinth that we're raising our facility up upon. Um, you can see this rippling effect of this facade. Uh, on page right is the uh, odor control vessels and its associated ductwork. We're here to basically, you know, exploit the wonderment and the complexity of this industrial facility. This is a view, uh, a southern view. This is at the access alley looking into the building. Um, there is a large aperture into the odor uh, the fan room, I should say, and then the other aperture is into the degritters. This is now a view at that corner of 2nd Avenue and 2nd Avenue and 5th Street or the access alley. You can see here that that plinth, we're raising the entire facility up in order to meet the design flood elevation. Uh, you can see those three main apertures, two of which will certainly be visible from the F train viaduct and the salt lot, as you can see there. And these last two, this is a view of the east elevation and this last one here uh, is a view of the facility in the IBZ zone. Uh, this is a view from the Whole Foods Esplanade looking across the river. Um, you can kind of see the F train viaduct in the distance and you can see what we're trying to achieve is the balance between natural systems and industry. And this last view here in elevation is on the west side looking back on the facility when you're in the further depths of the peninsula. There's a couple of details. Um, shot, bring you in a little bit closer. I have a question about the tank below. At sure. 4 million gallons, how much above capacity is that in percentage? How much above capacity of discharge? Yeah, like, yeah. because you're saying that it's the runoff from all of the neighborhood that keeps it from going in as raw sewage into the Buenos Canal. That's right. So in worst case scenario, how much above capacity is that 4 million tank? So I'm going to ask Kevin Clark, who's on Zoom, to specifically answer your question. Okay. Can you unmute him? Is it eight million it's or four million? This it's one is million. this one is four million. We have another one that we're building, which is at the head end of the canal, right, right. at the top. That's eight million. Okay. Yeah. So. Good morning, everybody. So yes, this tank will, in an average year, right? Um, and, and rainfall changes from year to year, um, but in an average year. Um, this tank will completely uh, hold all but four storm events during that typical year. Um, and for those four storm events that exceed the capacity of the tank, that flow will pass through the tank and receive some treatment. So essentially the, 
the flow is screened, and there's also some settling of solids um, that occurs as the flow passes through the tank. So, so you're saying this is not 100% of capacity. This is something like 80 to 90% of capacity. Uh, it's a, yes, I think it's going to reduce uh, solids discharges to the canal in this location by 90%. Okay, great. And the tanks, uh, once the filtration and treatment has happened, then the, is it a percolation tank or it's just discharging the clean water into the canal? Like what's the- It is stored and then until the rain event is over and there's, well, there's capacity in the sewer to pump it back to one of, to the Owl's Head wastewater treatment plant. We have 14 treatment plants throughout the city. So this is in the Owl's Head sewer shed. Oh, I see. So it's really, it's a holding tank, it, right? Until the, until the storm passes and then we can pump it back into the system for, treat, for full treatment. So then it goes to Owl's Head treatment plant, it gets treated and then- and it Discharged into the waterway. Right. Exactly, but, like clean right. water. Before Owl's Head, the 10%, that isn't treated is still raw waste that goes into the Kiwanis Canal. So the point that Kevin was making is that it has the benefit of going through the sort of, I would, wouldn't really qualify it as primary treatment that has its own terminology with wastewater, right. but it has the benefit of going through the screens, which right. are pulling out like solids debris. and degrit. And then mm -hmm. as it goes through the tank, right, it, the tank right. fills sequentially, solids sink to the bottom. So what ultimately is going out isn't. Is still has bacteria, but no solids. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you said there was bioretention on, on site. I just yep. want to state, uh, just to be clear about that, you're referring to the wetlands that are to be constructed, correct? That's right. So, so surface area that, that has enough sort of uh, porous capacity in order to absorb any rainwater that may fall on the site. Right. So for, further less eliminating less any, any need to uh, use that tank. Okay. And what's yeah. the capacity of the bioretention that you're anticipating? We'll come back to you with more of those details. We're still working out with our civil team and the engineering team to get into the site design for the bioretention, but it's, it's more than the tidal marsh. We don't see those as holding that kind of stormwater treatment, but we're looking at um, following city standards for bioretention from the, off of the right of way areas, as well as on top of the site itself and looking at a number of different strategies for holding retention and filtering um, for water quality. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just want to remind us that we're 10 minutes over time, but I definitely yeah. want to give it back to you to well, wrap, wrap, up, wrap we, up the presentation. We have um, completed. I, that, completed. It just so happens. We <laughs> In that case, thank you so much. We appreciate your insightful presentation, but I will ask commissioners for additional comments about the architecture. Mm -hmm. I actually want to know more about the functioning of it and what actually is, I mean, it's a super fun site. So clearly it's very sensitive that any waste would go back into a site that we're cleaning up and we're all taxpayers here. And uh, as uh, one of the commissioners, uh, we, were we were chatting, I was like, well, so, so what happens if it gets, if there's waste and it filters, you know, we're at a lot less than 90% in any storm event because it fills with solids. So then uh, how long is it till owl head comes online and then we get better? Uh, I just want to group the questions and uh, then we can answer all of them. Manuel, you had a question. Oh, I'm curious about the, the green of the piping. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, is that, I, I might not have caught this, but was that existing structure and it's being painted? So that's order control vessels and the associated ductwork that's pulling air from the fan room on the second floor to those carbon filters, which scrub the air and purify it before it is then let out through the stack. So any, any air that comes out the stack is all purified. And then the, that's, it's green, that's the color you're proposing. For. It's green, yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I like that yeah. gesture, yeah. but- uh, No, we unfortunately don't. Yeah. And we, at the next meeting, we will have a certainly larger samples okay. of everything. Would you like okay. to answer Ken's question? I'm not sure I totally understood Ken's question. I'm sorry. <laughs> to begin with, this is the first that comes online. Right. This is the first intervention between raw sewage and the canal. Right. And then there's a second facility that's not built yet, and that's coming later. Oh, okay. sorry. I think this, the Alice Head water treatment facility, that is built. That's just that's south yes. of the okay. uh, Army Terminal in Brooklyn okay. and Alice Head Park. Okay. So all the water that's within this zone goes to the Alice Head site. That's why this site's referred to as Alice Head, because it okay. stores that water before just it checking. goes back down. Yep. And then, so. So anything, anything that is above the capacity of this, which is 90%, then goes raw sewage, well, raw bacteria or whatever, it's degraded. It's been processed some mm -hmm. and it goes into the canal and doesn't get to be cleaned and then put 
directly into the canal. But I don't understand is like, if it's at 90% now and it fills with waste, obviously the number goes down on a big rain event. So how often is it actually, how, how often we're talking about, how often is it actually cleared so that it can get to that full capacity of, which is 90% below full capacity when you have those four storm events that you're not accounting for in this facility. So how, how like, how, do, how does that work? I, if I could just try to possibly clarify, I think uh, the idea is that the facility fills up. Mm -hmm. um, it, it reaches a certain point where it, there's a pressure release valve, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's only so, so many gallons of tank water we could use. At that point, we, the facility has to let water out. Right. And so, but directly after a storm, literally that water is slowly then filtered right back to the system. So it's not like a matter of months go by or a matter of days. It's, it's literally continuously feeding that water directly back to the, back to the LZ site. Correct. And the solids are collected on site, and they're, they're then the infrequent traffic will come remove that those solids from, from the site itself. And they go to landfill, the solids? And they go to wherever DEP is contracted. That's a great question. Kevin Clark can probably answer that better than me on Zoom. Or we can get back to you. And, you know, I mean, yes, we do want to know about the color of the ducting. And yes, we want to know the air is clean. And we want to know about all of the different details. But also, like, we're Public Design Commission. And we want to know all of the things about how this will function uh, for the community and how it works. So, I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's I don't a, understand right now. And I don't That's understand, like, where does the waste go? Right. And when does it go? Like, is it is it cleared once a month? Because. That means in rainy season, it's actually not going to get, if it's only cleared once a month, it means in rainy season, you're not at 90%. You're like at 50% capacity, right? In spring. It's, so that's a question for a community that already has smell issues. It, it, if I may, uh, I, I can try and attempt to uh, address your question. So um, as Kevin and Alicia were explaining, when it does rain. Sorry, just oh. one second. This is Kevin Clark, our portfolio manager, who's on Zoom and is talking to you from a mysterious speaker in the room. Yes, <laughs> that was, that was very exciting. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the, when, when it rains and um, the, the capacity in the sewer system is reached, um, the sewer overflows into this CSO facility. Um, following the rain event, um, the sewer capacity or the capacity in the sewers is restored because it's no longer receiving storm flow. And so we then pump uh, the entire volume out of the tank back to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, the target is always within about 24 hours. And, uh, and, and in most cases, it's a lot quicker than that. It all depends on the storm. Um, and then following that, you know, there, there is some there are some solids that uh, have settled out and they, they're they basically deposited at the bottom of the tank, but the tank has um, some equipment to help clean and push those solids um, to uh, the dewatering system, which is basically a set of pumps um, at the at the front of the facility. Um, basically, we, we open up these large uh, like cisterns um, and it washes um, all of the solids towards that pumping system. Um, the solids are then removed on site, deposited in dumpsters. Uh, trucks come by, they pick up those dumpsters, and that material is uh, 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 disposed of at a landfill. Um, so essentially, within about 24 hours, um, and typically quicker than that, the tank is ready. It's cleaned and ready for the next storm event. And on average, it rains every, I think it's every 2.6 days or something like that. Um, so we are you know, the, the tank will be ready for that next rain event, the next storm event. Thank you, uh, Lori. So I guess just, I mean, we can keep a lot of that, but I do want to make sure that it's not like the one on the Upper West Side. Is that a wastewater treatment plant as well? So uh, I want to make a distinction because between... I just drove by it last night. It yeah. smelled. So I want to make a distinction. <laughs> I, I will let them know. Um, I want to make a distinction between a wastewater treatment plant. Right. Yeah. So we have a, we have 14 wastewater treatment plants all across the city. Right. Uh, many of you may know the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant, which is my personal favorite, designed by Jim Polshek of uh, formerly of the Design Commission. Um, and. So we have these facilities, there are 14 across the city. What's happening is that the sewage from the city system, which is in many cases combined sewage, that's both when you flush your toilet, use your sink, right? Your sanitary waste that's going down the drain, 
that in many cases throughout the city is connected to the stormwater system. It's all going down, right, catch basins at the corners. All of that water is going to the same pipe, right? So all of that is brought through, conveyed through the sewer system. We have over 7,000 miles of sewers in New York City. Um, that's conveyed largely by gravity um, throughout the system. We have pump stations at low points throughout the system that pump that sewage back up the hill so that it can go back down through the gravity system and make its way to the wastewater treatment plant. Wastewater treatment plants are very large facilities that do a variety of treatment. They are separating the water from the solids at those treatment facilities. The water is cleaned and released into surrounding water bodies. The solids and also the byproduct of wastewater treatment, which is biogas, can be renewably used um, and recycled. So that's the process that's happening at those wastewater so this plants. Is, this is a completely separate type right. of system. Yes. This is a big old bathtub <laughs> that's holding on to the water when the system, when the sewer system, which in some cases is over 100 years old in New York City, um, meets capacity, there's a fail safe in the system, which is that it just it outflows into local waterways. In some instances, that's more of a problem than others. When you get a small waterway like the Gowanus Canal, it's a bigger problem, right? So that's why we have a facility that's gonna hold on to that here, wait until the storm, the storm passes, when the capacity is restored to the sewer system, it's pumped back into that sewer system. Okay, does that make sense? So I had some architectural yes. oh, points <laughs> as well, yes. just, I mean, that's super important and the design commission is concerned with the quality of life. Right, of course. So, but just to say, um, first of all, thank you to the DEC for, DEP for doing projects like this, for making design excellence part of your world. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you really, let's do a lot more of it. Um, so here we are. So just a couple of questions for the architect and the landscape architect. So when you show the project maybe going forward, it would be great. I, is this a collage or a rendering? A rendering. Yeah. Yep. So you showed those beautiful photographs and then you outlined what is going away mm -hmm. in the very beginning. Can mm -hmm. you put your project into those going forward so we can understand how it sits in a larger context? Sure. Yes. Right. Yes. Of the, because when you show your renderings, because we want to see the building, but then everything else is kind of faded away a little. Yes. It's yes. Like misty. Yes. <laughs> so it'd be great if it was just collaged. So from a, from, I mean? from an I'm aerial sure perspective or somewhere, well, so you could see a broader context. See it on the ground, not air, not birds. Where people on the ground. See okay. It from different, or, the, like, or the subway. Yeah, like key yeah. yeah. locations yeah. where people are coming from. That kind of thing. Fair enough. Like people, yes, that's great. Are. Okay. Hope. So then the concrete. So you have a lot of concrete. So the GSA is uh, uh, requiring low embodied carbon concrete. So I'm wondering if you're thinking about that. Yes. This is a lot of concrete. Yes, it's a lot concrete of concrete. It has a and big a carbon footprint. Yes, and everything we've been concerned with. Uh, New, York, New York State has passed a series of laws which are obviously obliged to uh, uphold. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, the uh, material, uh, ash fly, can be used yeah. in many right. instances. Um, the fact that we are using uh, concrete to meet the critical needs, the, infrastructure, the structural needs of the building, um, and we decided as a team that it would be better to use that, that singular entity rather than skidding the building using more material. Can we use low embodied carbon because it's not. No, we can. You can. Yeah, we can. But it's we. It's just like yes or no. Oh, yes. I, I think I said that at first. That we are right. using low embodied carbon. Um, but the other, in addition to that, we want to use the same formwork, the same form, mm -hmm. and it's not precast, it's the same form, cast in place to not only meet the infrastructural requirements, but the facade the architectural facade be the skin of the building right, right. so um the couple things the, mm -hmm. so now i'm getting into detail sure. so excuse me so the um the cat so i want to talk about the, the glass mm -hmm. it'd be great to see the night rendering yes because i think that's why you have that yes because you want us to know there's something there glowing at night that's right because i don't know if it's going to look like that during the day i mean that, which I'm sure you know, this because this is a concept drawing. So the detailing of that glass is not going to look like that. There'll be a frame, most likely. Well, we're working with um, front, and we're working with a couple of consultants right now to try to achieve a look like that, where we're mitigating any use of a frame, and if not, internalize it. Um, so we're trying our best to achieve it. But yes, there there could be a moment where we would have to switch positions and introduce a frame, I mean, particularly at the top and bottom. I mean, there are other, you could use polycarbonate, you probably maybe don't want to, but I mean, 
to achieve it with a lot less cost, if that's of a concern. And then the other point would be the, um, the capping when we go to the section, like the heavy lines, the horizontal lines, I guess, I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with your precedent of the, I mean, these silos didn't have caps on them. So you're going, you have this heavy shadow line, which you don't have to have. That's right. And so you've got these big horizontal lines. So I was kind of wondering about that relative to the, you're trying to go for this vertical scale, which is very beautiful. I think the facade mm -hmm. is very beautiful. The scale of it that you're studying is very beautiful. And so I was just wondering about that. We, we, we to extent, we're, we're looking at that. There were some cases where they had the flat top uh, on top of some of the silos that we saw. In most cases, it, it conformed to the concave formwork. But in some cases, there was a, a flat piece of concrete, probably just due to easier way to form it. Um, but what we wanted to do, this, it's, what we wanted to really achieve is some sort of vertical or horizontal datums to offset the verticality of the building, especially at the primary space, because it is one of the taller structures in this IBZ zone. So in order to kind of sort of have this duality between horizontality and verticality, that we introduce that. Plus during the day, you'll start to get these shadow lines, which will further accentuate the curvature of those tubular forms, which we thought was quite nice. And I will add that we do need some canopy structures throughout the building mm -hmm. for, for operations. So this so is the way to kind of seamlessly intersection. So this, this can, is it? Yeah. Those, right? So yeah, that's, no, it's a I mean, continuous datum. This is where we have the most opening. This is along the access alley where we have the most sort of uh, doors in right. and out of the facility. And the, um, the, so the composting also seems like an interesting program. Oh, yeah. that's coming in that, I mean, whether, it, I don't know if it's gonna smell, but I think like how the community, I mean, I think it's very exciting that it's gonna be there actually. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that gets worked into your project. Yeah, more to come on that. Yeah, the ensemble of all this would be great. And one last thing, there, there will be a lot of development. It's already zoned for very tall buildings around here. And mm -hmm. so your roof, is a fifth facade for those buildings. That's right. Right. So it, do you ever, so I guess it's not looking at it from a bird, but looking at it from buildings looking down, so because I know she has a very high parapet. So the grass, the green roof is seen by whom? The green roof will be seen, any, any development that happens across here, the green roof will, will be seen on the upper primary volume, but these secondary volumes, you should actually be able to get a glimpse of them from the Smith and Ninth Street station. I think um, that's a lot of uh, good discussion and good direction. I will uh, let Deborah summarize and uh, we look forward to it coming back. Thank you. So thank you for this very clear and elegant presentation and also for the very elegant and contextually fitting uh, structure. Um, when you come back, we look forward to learning more about the kind of concrete that you're using. We understand that it's both form and, sh and structure and, and facade, so we'll learn more about that. Um, we'd like to see and, and we request a, a contextual collage that also includes a night rendering and some window details mm -hmm. regarding anything, how, how the glass sits in the structure. Sure. And then finally, uh, uh, clarity, and we know that your preliminary, the clarity on the landscape. The, the bioretention, the function of the landscape, and the relationship of the compost facility to the public use areas. But thank you very much. It's a very thank elegant you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Much. Thank, thank, you. Your time. thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on. The public meeting is now commencing with the. Yeah. Uh, it's the consent agenda. Um, the public meeting is now commencing with the consent agenda. And items number 28266 to 28289. Please note the withdrawal of item number 28287. Staff has noted Commissioner Sheffer's recusal from item 28286. Are there any additional recusals, abstentions, or no votes? Just give me that number again, 28. Uh, the withdrawal. Um, oh, no, the recusal, uh, Commissioner Sheffer's recusal from item 28286. I guess I'm sure. Are there any additional recusals, abstentions, or no votes? Okay. Let the record show that, our, that there are no other recusals, abstentions, or no votes. I'll now call for the vote. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote for the 
consent agenda. Kenseth Armstead. Approval. Lori Hawkinson. Approval. Deborah Martin. Approval. Manuel Miranda. Approval. Susan Morgenthau. Approval. Ethel Shepherd. Approval with the noted uh, recusal from the night. Thank you. Meryl Tish. Approval. Mary Valverde, who is voting remotely. Approve all. Thank you. The consent agenda is approved. Let the record show all in favor. Okay. Um, we will now continue with the public hearing. I believe the team is all here. Uh, the first item is 28290, the pre preliminary review of the construction of a maintenance and operations facility and adjacent site work, Orchard Beach, between Park Drive and Promenade in the Bronx. For standard procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony, if signed up for, will be heard, and then commission will ask questions, deliberate, and vote. We will hear in-person testimony first, followed by testimony from remote participation participants. Okay, we can now proceed. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us back. Um, I'm Mimi Huang of N Architects. Um, we are the lead architect, and I'm joined by Amy from W Architecture, who will um, present the landscape. Um, so we submitted two packages to you, one for preliminary and final for the roadway only. Um, but I'm going to go through the pre preliminary package for the building design. Um, okay, so I'm not going to talk to these slides. These are the same as last time. Um, the site is at Orchard Beach. It is right next to the existing historic pavilion that is under construction. It's up the hill from it. This is an MO building for parks, and so there's no public access. Um, it's mainly for parks, staff, um, and there's also a fueling station. So this is the proposed site plan. Um, not much has changed in terms of the overall site plan. Um, things have shifted around to avoid woodland area to minimize tree removal. Um, and, but otherwise, um, the main um, intervention is the new connector road and then a new beach road, the service yard, and then the new building. I, I won't get into this. This um, will be Amy getting into this in terms of the. The new road is important. Thank you, because um, um, part th this is basically a maintenance yard and building for parks, and so their fleet of vehicles to maintain the park is um, going to be housed in this service yard. Um, and maintained and etc. The other reason why is because of this fueling station, which is not just for parks vehicles, it's also for NYPD and other agency vehicles. And so um, the good news is that we were able to um, collaborate with MTA and get their approval to use their bus loop, um, which allowed us to uh, avoid having to construct another road um, which would be very lengthy and which would have removed a lot of trees. And so this new road basically connects to the existing bus loop and brings you up the hill. It's quite a significant grade up the hill. Um, and so when you arrive, you arrive at a uh, guest parking and then the service yard behind. So this was the concept plan um, from, from before. Um, small things have changed. Um, this is the, the new plan. We had to chamfer this be, to avoid woodland area and basically have been massaging it to reduce um, uh, impact into the woodland area. So basically you arrive here, this is the guest parking and then this is all of parks, um, vehicle uh, storage and maintenance. This was the plan from concept. Um, the program is the same. We've been changing things like moving the cores and mainly um, focusing on the structure. And so um, during concept, we hadn't looked at structure at all. We were focused on the siting of the project. Um, so now the superstructure is concrete slab 
with 18 by 18 perimeter columns and interior columns, um, which dictates the rhythm of the facade, which, so, you know, the previous facade, we, we weren't actually doing a facade, we were just doing something placeholder. Um, so you can see these perimeter columns here. Um, there isn't a regular grid because each one of these rooms, you know, the whole program is very, very mixed. There's not a lot of repetition. There's kind of one or two of each thing. Um, so the perimeter columns needs to be maximum 20 feet apart, but there are many more slim rooms. So it's not a very consistent grid, which is why we tried on the facade to um, uh, st regularize it a bit. Um, we heard you about the mechanical equipment on the roof um, last time. And so we created a courtyard so that all of that mechanical equipment is not seen. So that's the main um, change to these plans. This is the second floor plan. And you can see um, on both floors, we're trying to push those. No, the courtyard is on the second floor. So I just want to tell you from the buildings in New York City during Superstorm Sandy, a lot of, I'm just going to speak from hospitals, whereas I have cultural institution experience as well as other kinds. Uh, after the storm, they decided to move all of, and they got all that federal money to redo all of these issues around what they kept in the basement or between the first and second floor, it was decided that all of these things would be raised up. Given the location of this, given the weather systems that we are experiencing, do you think it is wise to put it on the second floor? Yes. Um, you do? Yes. Okay. Well, let, let me get to it in the sections because it will be more protected. And um, we are well out of the floodplain. It's way up. We are well out of the floodplain. Yeah. So, so um, we are at plus 28. The floodplain is 10 feet below 20. Sorry. We are at plus 28. Let me go to a section. This is from concept. Um, this is the current section. Um, the floodplain, the DFE, is about 10 feet below our grade, or below the first floor. Okay. Great. Great. Okay, so um, just backing up to the, just to finish off, this is the roof plan um, with the sunken courtyard. So the sunken courtyard is on the second floor level um, and the, the, the roof is basically a green roof, the, the whole thing um, with a small stair bulkhead. I was just worried about the floor. Mm -hmm. So this is the new section showing the cut through the mechanical courtyard and that stair that gives access to it. This is the cut through that bulkhead um, stair, which is pushed back from the public beach side so that you can't see it, or rather minimizing it. Um, these were the facades from concept um, where we were just putting them for massing um, before we got into materials, et cetera. Um, and these are the new ones. Um, we are keeping this kind of two datum, like a lower datum that picks up the lower yard and an upper one. And then this is the fueling station that is in the back and it is trying not to call attention to itself. So there's no canopy, um, just a security fence. Um, so in terms of the materials, this is what we spent a, a lot of time on since we last saw you. Um, we looked at the initial, the historic plan. Um, There's a very, very monumental crescent shaped public pavilion um, and we are looking at the materials and also the geometry. And so we are um, proposing a kind of scalloped facade. Um, there's a lower datum that um, is in line with the lower datum of the historic pavilion and then an upper datum where the um, scallop um, is half as small. And we're trying to speak to the, the color palette that is there. Um, so this is the requirement of the yard wall. Um, Parks needs it to be eight feet. That sets up our lower datum. 
this is the entry of the building with the park's logo. Um, this is the side that faces the beach. Um, there are many requirements for these um, windows. So um, these big windows, um, we try to maximize those wherever possible. Those are in the offices, the break rooms, and the meeting room. Um, the smaller windows are in more back of house, so material storage kind of um, uh, places. These are locker rooms. Those small windows, they need to be set at five feet, the, the, the sill, um, whereas the other ones are set at 30 inches off the floor. These are offices above and um, equipment storage below, which explains the smaller window. And then this is the side that is facing the courtyard with an opening um, for the mechanical courtyard. This is another office, um, general equipment, workshops. Um, but we did give a window to that uh, one of the stairwells. I'm gonna hand it over to Amy. So the landscape concept is very straightforward. Um, it's augmenting and enhancing the existing rich natural forest, uh, adding uh, some green infrastructure components to treat the stormwater, plant, uh, stormwater from the new surfaces. The current design maintains that original concept. And as you move in closer, you see in the lighter green is our stormwater planting areas. And then the darker green is the woodland planting areas. And uh, you can see we're planting 225 new trees to uh, offset the trees that have to be removed. We look at looking at the bile swales, um, we're focusing on a wide variety of textures, colors, seasonal interest, height differences, um, all with the goal of not only treating stormwater, but creating this a layered forest effect that also functions as habitat and screens and beautifies. Likewise with the woodland planting, it's a rich variety of colors, textures, seasonal interest uh, to both uh, provide that rich forest experience and also give uh, parks the capability of maintaining it easily. Thank you, Amy. So uh, just, I'm going to wrap up with views of the project. This was from concept design. Um, these are the more current views. Um, Parks really wanted us to screen the building um, so that it wouldn't be inviting for the public to go up there. So we've worked a lot with um, W, um, with grading and berms and things like that and, and plants, um, including evergreen. So we are slowly coming up the existing pedestrian path to, to the building. This is that north face of the building. We're now on the top of that path. This is the gate into the service yard. Um, right now we are looking at precast concrete panels, um, insulated precast concrete panels for speed, for cost efficiency, and because it is lower carbon energy than in situ concrete. This is the road coming up from that bus loop. So this is the existing um, bus shelter, and this is the new connector uh, road. And here you've arrived at the top of that road. You can go into the service yard or you can hang a right to the fueling station, um, which is here, which is tucked behind so that again, it's not visible from the public beach goers. And here you've kind of come around that road. Um, the fueling station is back here. This is the south end of the yard. It's open at both ends because of traffic and the fueling requirements. Um, and now you're coming down that beach road, looking back at the screened building. And that's all we have for you today. Can you show us again in the renderings what the public views would be like from going yes. to the beach? Yes. Just so clear. if you are going to the beach, yeah. um, you will see this. So okay. the bus drop off is right here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see it. In, so this is the bus drop off, yeah. right? And so you might take one of these paths to get to the beach. This is the big crescent promenade. Got it. So we're getting so, out of the bus and yeah. moving towards us. And, yeah, and, and you're looking back. Um, and, you know, 
Is that your wall here? We're looking on the right. No, this is the existing historic pavilion wall. And, and that's what I mean by, you know, the, the building is has two datums. Um, one of them evoking this low wall that wraps around that entire, um, the, the two wings of the historic pavilion. And you, you can, but you can see our wall. That's, so your wall is also the pretext. Yes. So the lower pretext is the scallop that's there. Both of them are the scallop. But you change something changes or just changes scale? It changes, scale? Scale. Changes, the height yeah. it changes in scale. Yeah. So it's a tall. It's it changes the height of the precast um, is the same, but it changes in terms of the width of the precast. So if I can go back to the model. Oh, the height is, you can't get tall panels. There you are, you can't get one panel. No. That's, that's the height of the mirror. Those are two panels. There, there are two panels just to break it up. We haven't quite finalized the panelization. Uh -huh. When I say panels, it's just the kind of the pattern. Because they can be. They can be very I tall. Flat, be tall. Yeah, right. it could, it could be, it yeah, it could be this, be you know. That could be the panel. Yeah. I'm just talking about the scalloping. Yeah. Nine feet or whatever, 12 feet. Yeah. So this um, this lower part of the that's three foot by three foot by three? Three two, three foot two. It's been sliding around. 38 inches. And then the one above is half of that. And you can see it in this model. So it's kind of like a recitation. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And those are the windows operable? Some of them are. Um, and what are the windows? What are the what's the material for the window frame? They're aluminum. aluminum. They need to be hurricane resistant. They need to be super, super performative. Mm -hmm. So we're in the middle of finalizing what the, you know, which one meets all of those standards. Um, in, so this is one of their big meeting rooms, the, the main meeting room, um, break room office. This is another break room. The, yeah. All of those windows, th there's a sliding portion. And the columns are inboard yes. in the room. In, yes. So that window could be like a long window with just the column showing through it, for instance, because it's, it's no, the not, structure, you don't need a lentil because you've got. We, what our column? limitation, so those are the two, that's the you column. know, yeah. that's the column. Um, it's really tricky with, so you can't with precast. It outside. It's really like they, um, for the precast panels, yeah. they need about 18 inches on either side of a window because they just need meat, you know. Um, it can go down to 12 but it's very difficult to do wider windows than this um, because currently the, the precast will not need extra lintels and steel to handle the spans that we have, which is about 13 something, um, but it's also to do with the panelization. So, the, so that, that's the two windows. This was the big one on the end. This is the other break room, another big one. These are 13.9 wide. So those big ones are 13 foot nine wide, yes. So the, the precast panels, they're gonna go into a, 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 a substructure that's like a, so that like cleats, so that they can be clips. take clips. Yeah, they're going to clips on a rack, on a, like a rack system, so they can be taken in and out if they're damaged in storm, et cetera. Um, no, it's, it's not a rain screen. No. They're hefty. Yeah. So it, it's what is so good about it. Mm -hmm. Number one is cost. Two, right. they're more energy efficient. Right. Um, but it's basically the whole assembly. So there's an inner layer mm -hmm. of concrete that is five to six inches. And then there's insulation about three and a half inches. And then the finished layer. And because of the scallop, that finished layer is five to seven inches thick. That's the whole assembly. And that gets clipped to the slabs. So after about 20 years, if you did have to do any maintenance on the surface, you'd have to resurface the whole thing. You couldn't, re, you couldn't resurface individual components. Yeah. It. yeah. Pat, okay. It's, strong. it's okay. very strong. It's, very strong. Okay. it's yeah. You could, you would just, you wouldn't take those. Yeah. 
I mean, for parks, it's extremely attractive because there's no repointing. You know, there's like, you know, parks really didn't want brick because they don't have, you know, they don't want to be repointing, you know, so there's, there's no, none of that complication. Well, that's really my question is mm -hmm. the life cycle of the material. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I surfaced the building with like concrete, like, like panels, yeah. but, but it was on a kind of more rack system and then they, they last about 20 years. And so this, there's no repointing, but you can just resurface it. You just take it back to a medium and you put a new salt, you put a new finished surface on it. I don't anticipate. Yeah, please. It's, it's no problem. Yeah, okay. <laughs> just to, I 40 feet high and you clip them yeah. on, they, get, they could get damaged when they bring them to the site. Yeah. That's the problem where they right. get damaged. So then you have to figure out how to repair them on site, like other yeah. store them also. But they're, they're not going to return. Okay. They're really so strong. They don't come I mean, in means of uh, just one moment before we continue our discussion. I know that we probably don't have any public testimony, but I just want to confirm before we keep going. Okay, there's nobody signed up in person or online. Okay, we can continue with the discussion. Pardon me. When we last met, I mean, we talked about the circulate set. I understand that there's over 100 uh, park staff who will come here in mm -hmm. the summertime and a great deal fewer in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about the circulation from public transit to the building and what mm -hmm. the entry sequence was like. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could take us through that as it is now, because I understand there were some uh, shifts since we last saw the scene. Yes, yeah. So since we last talked to you, we got MTA approval to use their bus loops. Um, oh, so okay. we can so, so we can be a little bit more um, definitive about that. So this is where the buses will drop off. Okay. Um, for ADA access up, which we not we're not sure that we need it from the bus loop, um, but um, you know you would be, this is existing. The complication for us is that this crescent that you see that is. MTA canopy, and there is no time frame. It's all boarded up right now, and there's no time frame for when they will repair this. It's been like that for years, right? So we have to kind of figure out how to get to the building, not using the sidewalk that is conveniently under this canopy because it's all boarded up, right? So we're thinking about, you know, should we cut across? Traffic engineer doesn't like that. Um, safer would be to use the paths that are already there. So that's that's pedestrian. This is the new road and there's gonna be a sidewalk up. The other way is that um, this path here is actually existing and it's an existing gravel path and that will remain. And um, this part we're not touching, but then we're just changing this part so that it, you know, bends around to the entry of the building. Would so that send people a great deal out of the way, like well, in bad weather, for example. That that is for park staff, and their concern was to get from the historic pavilion. Oh, I see. Got it. Up to the building in but an easy the, way. But so you would not be sending folks who got off the bus in that way. Yeah, there's no public. The, like so, the, the 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 main concern was to separate beachgoers from any kind of vehicular traffic. So that so th that's what we're trying to do by saying, okay, the bus drop off is here. If you want to go to the beach, you come down like that. Right now, the bus drop is is here, okay. and there and, and that is a bottleneck because that's where we wanted to put the new connector road. But, so, but park staff who are kind of, who, is there an, uh, anticipating that any park staff would arrive by bus? I guess that's one of the ones. And yes. How they would get yes. Yes. The, yes. Yeah. Right. Some are especially they arrive by bus and they would mm -hmm. go around the. Yeah. Yeah. Line. yeah. This 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 way. Uh, so got it. All right. So they don't have to go all the way the other way. Where no, they don't have to go down got here it. and then up. Okay. No. Understood. Thank yeah. you. That was my question. Mm -hmm. So you don't have any samples of the color of the. No, we couldn't. We couldn't get them in time. Um, but we are, you know, thinking of, you know, change like adjusting color and possibly texture between the lower and the upper datum. 
but um, it's been hard to get samples in time for people to pay attention. Um, it's custom, you know, so the best we could get, um, and, and we're just, you know, on the phone now, we can send them, um, we can mail them in. That'll take a while to produce. But I mean, did you, do you have a dimension of it that you're? Yes. Um, that, like if you make it a phone or something. Yeah, we I should have. It's ironic that no public yeah. is to see the building. It's, it's very beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's too bad. Um, we have, this is a 3D model that I didn't think to bring. But anyway, we have other models. Um, this is the lower datum. That's the three foot. Three, but foot, three right. foot two. Yeah, and then the other one. Is and then this one is half of that. So it's just you know, two A to A. Yeah, it's great. That's it. And um, but it doesn't align with the floors. Hard to see white on white. Should have it's spray like painted this. <laughs> <laughs> and my baby drives. Mm -hmm. Are there any additional questions from anybody? I will let Deborah summarize. Um, there really weren't any comments for additional um, information, I believe, from the team. We appreciate that you moved the electrical higher and also answered the questions regarding circulation. And I'll second what Lori said that uh, it's a shame that you're beautiful building uh, will be not very visible to the public, <laughs> but uh, I think that parks will, will uh, enjoy a very low maintenance and uh, functional, beautiful structure for their MMO staff. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you for your time. Uh, we will take a vote. However, just give us one minute. We're waiting for Commissioner Sheffer to come back. We do have quorum, so we can also pass it, um, but let's wait 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. okay, seeing... Um, Everyone has completed our discussion. I will now take a roll call vote on item 28290. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote. Kenseth? Approved. Lori? Approved. Deborah? Approved. Manuel? Approved. Susan? Approved. Meryl? Approved. Ethel? Yeah, approved. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Mary Valverde, who is voting remotely? Approved. Let the record show all in favor. The project is approved. Moving on, the second and final public hearing item is 28291, the preliminary review of the construction of an environmental learning center, Solar 2, at Peter Cooper Road, Manhattan. Per standard procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, public testimony will be heard, and then we will ask questions, deliberate, and vote. We can now proceed with the presentation. Once the team is here, <laughs> give them a minute. <laughs> All right. Hi. We are ready for the presentation whenever the team is set up. Thanks. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you. We will now have the presentation. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. You guys can hear me okay? Great. Uh, well, thanks for uh, having us here to present Solar 2 Environmental Educational Center. We were here actually in August to do the conceptual presentation. Um, and since then, we have uh, gone back to the community board six and received unanimous approval as well. Uh, and now we're here to do the preliminary um, uh, presentation uh, for the project. And I'd like to start by introducing the team or allow the team to introduce themselves, starting with Dina on the left here. I'm Dina Elkin. I'm the director of events and park at Solar One. Hi, I'm Ian Goldberg. I'm the project manager for Gilbane Building Company, the construction manager. Hi, I'm Steve Levin, CEO at Solar One. Hi, OD Olener. I'm at EDC uh, and I work in the capital program department and we're implementing the project on behalf of Solar One. Hi, I'm Kitana Lavri from EDC working with COVID. Hi, I'm uh, Katrina Nelson, junior designer at BIG. Hi, I'm Douglas Alligood. I'm a partner in charge at BIG. <laughs> and I'm, uh, my name is Ryan Harvey and I'm project architect at BIG. Um, so let's get into it. Um, so the site is uh, located on the uh, eastern side of Manhattan on the shore of the East River. It's located within a uh, flood zone VE uh, with a design flood elevation of uh, 17 feet. Um, and I'll take you through uh, the, the, the site. Uh, this is uh, showing the site currently under construction with the ESCR moving its way from the south in the northerly direct direction. We have the entry from 23rd Street uh, through the floodgates, you can kind of see through the, the photograph. Once you enter through the floodgates um, to the north of the site, you are presented with the parking garage and the, the gas station to your left. And then turning to the right, you're on the north edge of the site uh, upon entry. Currently, there are there's the Solar One building. Um, and the, some of the existing boulders that have been placed on the site temporarily. Uh, moving into the site, looking back towards the existing Solar One building, and then turning around and looking directly south at the current conditions of the ESCR um, under construction. Uh, and then finally, standing on top of the ESCR construction, looking uh, north towards the existing Solar One uh, building. The site plan that exists currently, of course, is the, the Solar One uh, building uh, and the ESCR um, built up to this point here. And of course, the flood wall uh, currently constructed as well. Uh, looking at the site condition, the team has took, taken into consideration the prevailing wind patterns, as well as the solar radiation that the site um, is exposed to and allowed it to help uh, design the, the roof and the massing. Uh, looking at the current proposal uh, relative to the zoning envelope, the building does fit within the, the zoning envelope, of course. Um, and then one of the comments from the previous uh, concept presentation was public access. Um, so this drawing illustrates the, the access from the, the green line or the four, five, six, <laughs> the four, six, sorry, um, uh, from 23rd Street and then the L train here at um, 14th Street, as well as a series of bus stops uh, that uh, let you off at along Avenue C and a ferry access as well to the south of the, of the site. <clears throat> then zooming in a little bit more, uh, of course, here's our, our path of entry from the 23rd Street through the floodgate, um, and then entering the, the landscaped portion of the ESCR from the north, as well as a uh, bicycle path along the western edge of the site, and uh, access from the, the south via the ESCR uh, into, the, into the project. 
there was a question with respect to uh, public access or public access to public washrooms. There is a recreational center maintained by the Parks Department at Astor Levy and um, the future uh, Murphy Brothers Comfort Station that's part of the ESCR development. There was a question as well with respect to the ESCR and its coordination with our project. So as it stands right now, the project, uh, the ESCR project uh, extends to this point with a, essentially a termination line waiting for the solar two project to be constructed. Um, so simply illustrating the outline of the building uh, relative to that termination point. Um, and this diagram is intended to illustrate that the solar one or solar two project rather is, is really scoped to the definition of what the blue line is showing here on this project, the footprint of the building. Uh, but the ESCR scope is going to continue around um, and through the, and through the, the, um, the project shown in gray. Uh, so this is the currently designed ESCR project without any uh, uh, building shown on it. Um, and what the, the project is currently working with the ESCR to coordinate is modifying their landscape design to allow for the incorporation and the coordination of our, 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 of our project um, to, to integrate the landscape with the, the building's design and programming at uh, grade. Furthermore, the project looks to take advantage of some of the already constructed um, bench seatings, uh, stadium or amphitheater type seating that in, is incorporated into the landscape. But it also looks to uh, utilize some of those existing boulders that you saw re earlier in the, in the uh, site photographs as seating elements around the entry and within and underneath the building at, 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 um, at grade. Moving into the architecture, um, since the concept design, we've, we've moved away from the core 10 building and, and started to look at modified wood, which you'll see a sample here on the table uh, made by a company called uh, Kebony. Um, we still have the high performance glazing and then looking at some of our, our um, precedent projects uh, in the sort of uh, part of the parks, the, uh, parks department and uh, flood zone areas looking at some of this, the uh, galvanized metal grading that they utilize as well to be used at uh, areas where it's um, on a ground floor where we have the flood zone issues. And then of course, solar panels. And if I speak a little bit more about the wood, what the team was trying to do was look for, uh, is look for an opportunity to reconsider how we're approaching the, the narrative when it comes to environmental design and um, we, that's why we started looking at this particular product, the, the wood, which has also been used in some previous um, public projects, the Pier 26, Jones Beach Energy Center, um, and Hunters Point South as well. Um, and we also think that it helps, uh, or sorry, it does uh, speak to the narrative that the Core 10 uh, also had, which was changing with time and really reflecting what the material or how the material behaves over time when exposed to the environment. Um, and then maybe just a little bit of a, uh, something uh, interesting is just understanding the process when it comes to how the wood uh, is modified. It's first harvested from fast grow growing softwood forests and then combined with the byproduct of sugar cane and corn uh, production to take essentially a softwood and give it hardwood properties. And then finally, uh, what the building looks like now with its uh, new wood cladding uh, screen uh, and, and, and opaque areas um, and an updated rendering you showing it from the south and then one from a uh, ferry. <laughs> And then now moving into the, the program, which has remained uh, the same uh, with storage areas and point of entry located at grade. And then classrooms um, located on the second story, which can be combined into one major classroom, an office space uh, for administration staff, 
some storage spaces, of course, and then your water closets and mechanical room uh, bar to the west, really, and then a corridor that connects these spaces. And then looking at the roof, we have our, our PVs. We have our required uh, FDNY access paths, um, equipment, and uh, battery storage as well. And then looking at the, the lighting, um, exterior lighting, the concept is really to, to illuminate the, the essentially the screen or the perforated area of the, of the project uh, at grade so that the, the building appears to float essentially at night. And then looking at the sections, um, we've got the inclined roof that uh, allows for better solar performance and more act and also uh, becomes kind of like a billboard for people along the FDR, but also people coming from the south um, uh, from uh, or along the ESCR park. I uh, just went a little too far. And then just simply some uh, renderings uh, showing the materiality applied, the opaque, uh, opaque areas of the facade of wood, and then the wood screen element. And the, then what is essentially the galvanized uh, screening uh, below. And then we'll end on this, this rendering here. So open for questions. Thank you so Thank much you. for your presentation. I just wanted to confirm if we have public testimony. Great. Uh, commissioners, would you have any questions? Yeah. I think the changes are really nice. I think the screen is, you know, and the mass and everything is very beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a deck board. So but is this is what it'll look like when you put it on? It'll be this dark. It'll be that, yeah, caramel then color. It, then it shows you here. Yeah. This because you, what you're showing here is is the, the final product. The dark when it's just installed, but then it this is yeah lightens this is, up over who knows when time, right? Yeah. Do so this this is actually gray. Oh, that's great. Yeah. We have the worst projector. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. No, so that looks great. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. solid piece you're showing us because. So the samples that were sent, it's as part of their sample kit. Um, so you can get this product in a variety of different formats. You can get it as a cladding, like a shiplap. Um, yeah. type of assembly. It also comes in dimensional lumber as well. Is that what you're using for the slats, the dimensional lumber? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. once you start to start getting to the corners and the detailing of those, you really want to be able to express that. And the window frames are aluminum? And yeah. the when you show the elevation, we see this, what do you like, a 14 or 7 up to 14? What's your slope on your PVs? On the PVs, um, it looks very nice that you see them in that elevation. I'm yeah, that. so we'll have to develop the actual slope of those so that you do see them, but that's the intent. I mean, they yeah. have an optimal slope. Yeah, so that'll drive it, is the slope of the, the that'll drive it, is the optimal, right. Right. optimal slope optimal for slope. performance. Yeah. And stationary, though. Correct. I mean, it's great to see them. Yeah. It's like the billboard of yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll let I'll let Ian speak to the duration of construction. Uh, the rough duration. Where would start? Sorry. Start. <laughs> the start would be uh, probably September twenty twenty three. And finish, hmm. I would say, conservatively, uh, 2024 in September, but uh, with uh, everyone here, can hopefully I sooner. You what I know? The wood material that you're using, it is a really hot material. Now. And I know a lot of builders using it. And I'm just curious if you're going to get caught in your shortage. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, every builder yeah. so that I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's a that's a really good point because that was actually one of the reasons why we 
uh, moved from the core tent to this material because um, in speaking with the distributor and the, and the manufacturers that they have stock in Queens and in Philadelphia, uh, that is more than what we would need by quite a bit. So we've been, that was part of the re reasoning why we chose this material. And I think one of the key things for us is like when we actually go to bid out, this is probably one of the early packages. So we get somebody on board to procure it, lock it in and be creative where if we have to store it somewhere over a long period of time, at least we know we have it. Yeah. No, no, you're right. That's for sure. One of the, one of the major reasonings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You showed the um, Esker limit of the landscape, that line, and then you showed another drawing that seemed to have the um, gradient of that little slope coming under the building. And I'm a little confused by that. I was just wondering, like, does the building sit on top of, like, on, on that? The right. Yeah. You, this drawing? Yes. Yeah. So the intent is that the that the landscape from that line that you saw, the termination line, continues through and underneath the building. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So it will actually, the building will sit, uh, there'll be a space that just the structural columns will go down. Correct. That, but that gradient will continue under the building. Correct. So what would it be? Under the building, we're looking at riprap. Uh, okay, so it's not meant to be occupied in any way? Correct. Because <laughs> nothing will grow there. Right, no, of course, it's in the dark. But yeah. I'm just wondering, like, is that publicly accessible? Uh, no, not publicly accessible. So does see how the grave is coming under the building? It's that area. Yes. So so it, it there'll be a fence at the edge. Yeah, there. yeah, that'll be defined by the metal, the galvanized grating. That'll keep people from getting on there or in there, but it will become essentially part of the the solar one domain. Right. So the river app is really just to pick up the grade uh, and hold. For for uh, uh, slope retention, that's that's all. Yep. Okay, got it. Right. Can you show the the stair stairway? Do you have a section? Yeah, it's a curious condition of it going under the building like that. Yeah. 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 So, so. Is that a section? Yeah. Yeah. Part of the. It's yeah. This is so. This is a long section. So if that's the shape of the building, it's a section through just after you enter the building. Do you have the, other the other side. That's what we're cutting east west. Right. Below. Yeah. That would be this. So what's occupied down there? Storage. Yeah. That's all we're allowed to have down there. And then that space on the west side of the building is it's, what is like riprap. Little alley between the fence. Oh, this and, here. Yeah. Yeah. That? So it'll be. If I go back to that site plan. That's like a, a, a straight that space, that's yeah. So that's there. that's essentially the continuation of this pathway, which is already built. Bring so it back down. The path, you're looking if you're looking if I'm walking on that path and I'm looking under the building, what do I see? You'll see the, the galvanized grating coming down to keep you from going in there, but you'll see the, the, the grating change from vegetation to riprap, right. Huh. So it's kind of like um, the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, so maybe that's exactly it. Yeah. 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 And what, what I'm wondering about is the experience of the pedestrian next to it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. 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 I think the landscape design that the ESCR team develops can definitely address some of that with vegetation. But so I that think. That would be within your scope. Correct. Yeah. I mean, the landscape itself. Yeah. So. But it is in the sense that that you're saying it's so the riprap design and what that will be that's not part of your program that's mm -hmm. the Esker team is working on whatever that will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. One thing that I, one thing that, that point is that um, the coordination between this project and the Esker because they're going to have to come back to do that berm. Yeah. 
because uh, right now they're they're kind of done with their northern edge and they're they're going to hold until this to coordinate with this project so so that's we meet bi-weekly with the esker team to really suss out all of the the details on that coordination even now okay so what i'm wondering is uh, i imagine that your team would be very uh, intimately involved in that collaboration with the esker team right yeah because you're building sitting on that little mm -hmm. slope yep and because uh, we're the Public Design Commission and, the, and there's a great deal of, like, people will be using that path. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if um, we could ask you to, to be uh, closely involved with what, yeah. how that gets designed. I think for sure. We would definitely want to have something to contribute to the public experience through that space. Exactly. Yeah. Because I think maybe it's a public art opportunity. I don't know what, mm -hmm. but right, but walking right next to roof wrap like that, looking under a building could be a mm -hmm. very threatening condition. I think it could be a threatening condition. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it would be a combination of lighting and materiality. I think the wood that. helps yes, with that agreed. for sure. Yes. Um, but I think that um, you're right. I think that's something that we'll want to contribute to. and Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. The way you go up because they have an upper level. That you yeah. Right? But you don't have the access. You come in underneath. From the so from the part of the inspiration, in a way, was this idea that you're able to walk up this riprap wall mm -hmm. and experience that grade change. Mm -hmm with the, that entry stair. But unlike Brooklyn Bridge, they have, there's the FDR right there, and then there's the building, so you're here. Yeah, I know. The, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. 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 I just wanted to talk to you about neighborliness. Mm -hmm. And I, this is the second project where there's a really great education component, and I feel that very strongly. But a lot of the community around this are middle class, working class, black and brown communities. And uh, if, if educating people about solar energy is uh, important, and I think it is, also, like, have you ever been to the BP, the gas station? Have you ever used their bathroom? Have you? No. But you know, if you ask, they let you? They would. They just give you the key and say, go sure. They would. Mm. And if I came to your house, you'd say, hey, yeah, use a bathroom. And it's just, it's just odd to me that if you're in the middle of this and you've made a new public park and it looks so cool and somebody's gonna come by and I, I'm with my four-year-old and, and she's not gonna care that, that she would need to do education on solar energy. And mm -hmm. she's not going to want to go a block yeah. after wanting to play there because it looks yeah. so inviting. Yeah, yeah. You made candy. And now you're saying, oh, yeah, have the candy. But by the way, unless you're in this education program, uh, young child of color, you must walk an extra block to pee. You probably want to dress that back here. I, I just, yeah. I, I'm just saying, yeah, I, I don't think that I'm not being heard. I think I, my voice is quite carrying. Yeah. And I, I just, I just, neighborliness is like, it's just it's just odd to me, and and it also it also undercurrent. We were we were just talking, Merle. You were just talking, and we were talking about like like yeah. It's like the, there's some element of this that is like it, to be inviting. Mm -hmm. It it is inviting, and yet somehow there's this other element. Like it, your neighbors can't come to your house and pee. I, they're not your neighbors if they're not welcome. So. So we have actually asked for a comfort station to be installed in Stuyvesant Cove Park, and we were told that because it's in the floodplain, they will not give us one. For years, I mean, for like practically the last 20 years, we have paid, Solar One has paid to have portageons for the public. And we have always actually, when people have come by with children to our tiny little building where there's exactly one flush toilet, mm -hmm. we have always let people use the bathroom. Now, that being said, like the space is not gonna be open 24 hours a day. The current space is not open 24 hours a day. If there's anything that you guys can do to help us get you know, a self-cleaning <laughs> comfort station, like we would like nothing better because the portageons are expensive. 
It's very difficult to keep them clean. We have quality of life issues in the park. Um, to the extent where we keep, we've gotten two Porta Johns, kept one unlocked for anybody to use, kept one locked for students, volunteers, staff while the site has been under construction and there's been no access to the building. I mean, this is a very challenging issue. And to, to my way of thinking, like even goes way beyond neighborliness to like, you know, how do we, how do we deal with these issues? And, you know, this is not designated as park space. This is still a marginal street on a city map. So we don't have any support from the parks department. It's difficult for us to get support <coughs> from NYPD, we do work with harm reduction groups and homeless outreach. Like we, we really try to be as open and friendly to everyone. And you know, we're right next to the VA, we're close to Bellevue. There are so many communities that use this park. Um, and you know, with the redesign, the redesign is beautiful. It may be intimidating to some of the people that have historically used the park. I'm thinking of like, the fishermen who have always fished off of the bulkhead. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we're gonna see, honestly, but it's yeah, we would love to have, to have a public bathroom, um, okay. but we have not been able to find a good so way to do that. Put a bathroom, the bathroom is X number of- whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, there's one, it's I guess the there may be one at Astro so Levy Playground. In the building itself, there will be restrooms. There will be three, three restrooms in the building. In the building, in the building yes. And, oh, okay. and so you will make them available for people who walk by informal. Yeah. When, the yes. yeah, when the building is open, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not talking about in the middle of the night because there are no four-year-olds in the middle of the night. <laughs> no, the ones that are bad kids. If, if never, the, bad kids. We never, we never, we never have policy. We never have policy that only people who have signed up for programs or who we are expecting. Um, and that's, that's what I'm most concerned about. So the idea that like Latin communities don't like being called Latinx, but college educated people keep calling them Latinx and they hate it is something that is problematic in sort of building community uh, and the labeling of you as educators and people feeling like they, you know, that there's some barrier to them if they're there to being able to walk in your front door if they have need. A lot of that need is just basic need. It's just human sure. need. And, and, and never noticed that people have felt constrained to ask us for stuff. <laughs> we have a, and, and so, so in our and our park programming is very outward facing. So we have um, um, one uh, park park manager right now. Um, we are hiring an additional um, uh, park educator uh, starting in January, and um, and it, it's always been uh, the orientation of this of, of our staff at Solar One who manage the park under Dina's leadership to. Um, to be outwardly facing and welcoming. Um, so, so anytime when this building is built, um, you know, anytime that it's open, we will absolutely make make uh, the restrooms, the three restrooms that we have, next, you know, that are going to be adjacent to the classrooms, um, open to the public and, and welcome. And it's you know, the, we view this as as a a place for the community to be. Um, it's a it's a you know, it's a um, outwardly facing and publicly facing. Um, resource and, and we want to make sure that it is um, regarded that way by the entire community. And an integrated staffing? Yes. Including management? Yes. And what are your hours? I don't remember yet. <laughs> expect your hours of operation days to So I think it's going to, I think it'll depend, it'll depend on the day, but I imagine that there will be, you know, public hours from, you know, 9 30 or 10 in the morning until about six at night and we're you know assuming that there will be after school programs and summer camp programs and weekend event programs so it should be pretty much seven days a week and you know on days when there's no evening programming probably open from around 10 to 6 and um, when there is evening programming, probably from 10 to 10 or 12 to 10, depending on exactly what's going on. Well, thank you very much, um, both for taking our commissioner's comments to heart last time, presenting us a revised proposal. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, 
just the note that you will coordinate closely with the SCR on the space behind the space beneath the building and making sure that experience is not threatening but welcoming. Um, thank you. I will now um, take a roll call vote on item 28291. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote. Ken Seth? Approve. Lori? Approved. Deborah? Approved. Manuel? Approved. Susan? Approved. Ethel? Approved. Meryl? With the caveat, I think we should have the Parks Department come to us and talk about public restrooms in this particular park. Uh, I mean, they're a sponsor of this programming. I think the question has been asked. I just think it deserves an answer. It has nothing to do with the, pro the integrity of the project or moving forward, which you absolutely should. But we approve a lot of design spaces for parks. And if it goes on our list, it'll go on the parks list. And so maybe there's a way to start that conversation. We're not getting too perfect in one day, right. but certainly this is a, you know, it's not an irrelevant question. Thank you, Meryl. I uh, know we will still um, approve <laughs> with that condition noted that we will come back and talk about this. Uh, Mary? Approved. Let the record show all in favor. Um, the project is approved. Thank you. The meeting is actually now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>